Hi, I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Schneer, and I'm so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend some here with us. Today on the podcast, we have Kyle Brickman, an assistant professor of management at the Odette School of Business at the University of Windsor. His research focuses on employee voice, resilience, and conflict in teams. His mission is to help organizations, teams, leaders, and employees lead happier, healthier, and more productive lives. Kyle holds a PhD in management in organizational behavior from the Smith School of Business at Queen's University, an MSc in management in organizational behavior and human resource management from Wilfrid Laurier University, and an HBA from the Ivy School of Business. Welcome, Kyle. Great. Thanks for having me. We're so happy to have you. And I want to learn all about you. I already know a little bit, but I want to learn even more. And I want to talk about your research because it is fascinating to me. So let's get started with you. What brought you to this point? How has your journey led you here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's a million dollar question of, of how you end up going to a career that you never really would have envisioned for yourself before. Exactly. You know, I talk about this with my students quite a bit too, just to kind of ease some of their concerns, because I know as a student and, and undergrad, especially I'm like, well, yeah, what, what do I want to do? And it, it certainly felt like there was an enormous pressure to get that answer right and get it right as soon as possible. And I think I did get it right eventually, but you know, it usually it's, it's not something that's just so direct, at least for most people, you know, some people are fortunate enough to kind of have that idea and it's just what sticks through them. For most of us, it is a, a very much a winding journey. You know, so for me, even I look back, I mean, I, I think I, I thought, you know, maybe academia would be for me, but that was more in maybe let's say history. So actually my undergrad, my first year was history was my major, switched to political science in my second year and switched to business in my third year. So you can see mm-hmm. bouncing around and even within the business program, I was, you know, debating what it is that I wanted to do. Did I want to get into accounting or marketing? For me, it was the idea was always early on was kind of keeping doors open, keep, keeping options open, trying things, seeing what you like. Eventually, though, I for me, the, the kind of the start of my career was I got a job. And maybe not what you would expect, but it was it was a job in sales at General Mills. And that's where I started my career after I graduated from Ivy. Worked there for a few years, but that's when the, the career change kind of happened. So you know, to kind of walk back even, I mean, for me, taking that job was was an opportunity. It was a great company. And I said, okay, well, if I can get a job at a great company doing something that I think is really interesting, the values, the culture sounded great. I just wanted to get my feet wet. And, and so that's why I kind of went there. Uh, still knowing this is not the end goal. Even as I was working in there, I said to myself, okay, maybe maybe I want to go back and, and go to law school. Maybe I want to go and, and get an MBA and further my education. I think I thought those thoughts because... Uh, they were they were definitely suggested to me by by close family members and thinking okay that's the that's the path to success and and that's the path a lot of people have followed you know for me what I found at General Mills and why I'm in the spot I'm in right now is I was so much more interested in how things worked at work than the work itself so speaking to that idea of finding what you're really passionate or very interested in it was around organizational behavior so how I ended up coming out here was I was really in my job I'm like okay I, it's interesting you know I like what I was doing it was a great job great company but you know, as an example, we were going through an organizational culture change and I was so much more interested in how that happened and, you know, the processes and how they maybe shared information with us or didn't and what the real reasons were and, and how that affected people's behaviors and their, and their feelings at work. And then I, I thought back, okay, I had this course, organizational behavior. I really liked it. My friends that I was in school with didn't really care for that course. And I'm like, okay, maybe there's something a little bit odd with me, but no, that's just really, that's what I find interesting. Yeah. So spending quite a bit of time reflecting, I worked with a, a coach and a friend kind of helping work through this idea of, of a why that's became really famous and popular with Simon Sinek. And so I'd give a, a shout out to my friend, Steve Shedletsky, who who was really helping me at that time kind of recognize what is it that, you know, there's a book by this a psychologist, Mikhail Menskela, I can never pronounce his name properly. So it's, the, the book he's wrote is on flow. And it's it's also like, what is this idea of when you're in the state of flow, where you're just completely absorbed in what you're doing, where time sort of passes by? 
it, it pushed me to go back to school and, and to get my master's because I knew this is what I wanted to do. But, you know, even that journey is so complicated. A little kind of funny story for me, at least, is I actually didn't even know that these MSc programs, that's what I did my when I went back to school, was I didn't even know that those existed. They were never something I learned about in, in undergrad. I didn't learn about it afterwards. I actually was in Vancouver touring UBC. I had accepted a tour there for UBC to, to go do an MBA there. And while I was in Vancouver, I had actually accepted my offer to do an MSc at Laurier. So it's interesting. I didn't know the path to get to where I am now. I certainly thought this is what I wanted to do. I knew I was interested in organizational behavior. I said, okay, maybe I could do some teaching. Maybe I could do some consulting in this space. I was just a topic that I knew I was really interested in. And so if you have to go back to school, right? To, to really further that. I wasn't going to do that in my company. And so it was for me, at least I, I thought if I want to do this, I want to do this right. I want to know what I'm talking about. I don't want to be teaching on something that I'm not knowledgeable on or consulting on something I'm not knowledgeable on. And so the one avenue was to do an MBA. That's not really the best way if you want to get into teaching. And, and I like teaching. I know that's also something that I, I thought I would enjoy the research I learned along the way. That is something I really love doing. But it was a teaching that drove me to that. Yeah, so I learned about these these MSCs, the Masters of Science that that are really popular. But again, nothing that I knew before. Applied to Laurier, completely overwhelmed in my first year there. Nothing could have prepared me for the amount of reading that I had to do that I was never exposed to before. Understanding science that it was never something that I was ever really exposed to in my undergrad. You know, but I, but I loved it and and encouraged me to keep moving forward to get a PhD with the ultimate goal to end up where I am. And I consider myself very lucky to have a, a great job at a great school at, at the Odette School of Business. Yeah, it sounds like it. And thank you so much for giving us all of that information about sort of your your decision-making that is so important. Okay, so the second that you said you were interested in how something happened, how the organization restructured, it was so clear to me why you got a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> the second that somebody says, oh, but I wasn't interested really in this, but I was interested in the how, the next step is the PhD. <laughs> but how you got there was, was, as you said, winding. And I think that that's really important because I didn't set out to get a PhD either. I didn't even know what a PhD was when I was an undergrad. I knew that my professors and TAs had them or were working towards them, but it was like this ominous title that you don't actually understand what goes into it. And my plan was never to get a master's. It was to go to medical school and to be a doctor. Like that was the that was the goal. And so I love hearing about the different choices that people are faced with. You were at another campus looking at their program and you accepted another one that you hadn't heard of before you had found it. And I think that this is such, this just speaks to the beauty of seeking out opportunity and letting things happen and and really being on the receiving end of those opportunities. And so I it it sounds like, you know, what happens with a lot of people, which is that they try to make their path linear or they assume that they need to have a linear path or that the path will be linear. And once you realize, okay, I thought it was going to be this, but actually it's this. And you sort of give not give into it, but you sort of embrace that a little bit, a world of opportunity opens. Do you feel that that's how it happened for you looking back? You know, for me, I, I think what I, I probably downplay and, and I, I definitely have a tendency, I probably downplay one of the most important things that guided me, which is which is that going back to that idea of a why. If you, if you don't have a North Star, a why kind of guiding your decisions, it's so easy to get lost along that journey. You need it now and it can change, but if you don't set it now, you're never going to get there. And I feel like I'm probably getting to the most important nugget of, a, you know, of idea or, or information that helped me at least, which, which is that why you really need to articulate that, make that as clear as possible, recognizing things will change, but that why is the why of why would I leave, right? Why would I keep pushing through? I mean, people in my MSC and before that kind of said, listen, I mean, academia is not for everybody, right? A PhD is not for everybody. It's not what you expect, like lots of warnings and rightfully so it is <laughs> pretty grueling. It's a, t it's a test of a perseverance as far as I'm concerned. And I was tested many times and there was no certainty I was going to make it through. But for me, if I don't think I had that why and the research would support that idea too, the purpose, it would have been really easy to kind of maybe veer into a different path that wasn't as challenging for me. And so at least for me, the 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 why, you know, how I kept moving through was the why. And the why for me is is what you heard eventually was articulated for me in that way, at which you introduced me to, you know, the, the introduction at the very beginning of, yeah. of you know, helping people find more meaning in their work, enjoying their work, more productive in their work. And and so with that, it allowed me to keep kind of knowing the direction I needed to take because that is how I got to the why. 
Yeah. And so let me ask you a question about the why. So helping people, helping to, you know, articulate their, their happiness in the workplace, find happiness in the workplace. Why does that speak to you? You know, it, it's, we spend so much of our time at work. I think if I look back to my thinking, even in undergrad and afterward, and that's when, you know, it, it started to take more shape. I never wanted to have a, a job that was a job. I never wanted to work for the weekend. Mm-hmm. That was just something that was it. And it just went against everything that I personally believed in. You know, I get think I, a lot of the times as I was going through this journey, I thought, okay, everyone probably looks at things a little bit similar to me. And I've definitely learned that that's not the case. I, I think I I thought, you know, oh, everybody kind of wants this, but but no, I mean, some people want that paycheck. Some people, everybody wants something quite different in their job, uh, right? Some people just want the community or it's the purpose that they're doing around their job. For me, it was I wanted to do something that was fulfilling, yeah, that, that at least made me feel like this was worth the time that I put into it and that I enjoy doing it. And so that's, that was kind of my, the why for my why is uh, I want to really, I don't want, again, I don't want to live for the weekend. I want my work to be interesting, important. Do I like every day that I work? Absolutely not. The idea that, you know, I love my job, I think is also maybe a very hard advice to give to people because there's going to be a lot of things you don't love about your job. You can't love everything about your job. I've never seen a job that you love everything, but you got to love, I think, what you're trying to do and, and maybe even how you try to do it. Yeah, I really appreciate that perspective. And so maybe take us through some of your work. I know a little bit about it, mm-hmm. as you know, but take us through how you actually started the process of defining your research questions. Like I want to start at the beginning because so many of the members of our community and so many of our listeners are at the beginning of their process, at the beginning of figuring out, okay, I want to do a master's how do I come up with my research question? And so when, when our clients work with me, they come with these like big questions, which are awesome, but often we need to really, really narrow the scope of those in order to make them doable, in order to actually finish a master's in the amount of time that is given. And in order to be able to just move on, because being in grad school is not going to be your full-time job forever. And that is something that I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand or are aware of on their way into grad school. So the importance of narrowing your your question, I think is something really important that we talk about in academia all the time with students that I supervise and with our clients. So what was that sort of initial process like for you where you realized, okay, I have so many questions. I have big questions. I have smaller questions. How do they all fit together? And how do I narrow my question down to something that is doable and manageable for my master's and then for your PhD? So like, how did that look for you? Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good question. It's again, that master's experience, a PhD experience is really difficult for a lot of reasons. And one of which is what you described, knowing what is it you're studying and is it going to help and does it matter? And you know, certainly the, the researcher and person I am today is vastly different than the person I was, you know, let alone, yes, you know, yeah, uh, last year, but certainly 10 years ago when I started my journey, I think I got my MSc in 2012. And so, you know, it was, it was a little while ago. You know, you're going to get a lot of advice. It's hard to also choose which advice is the right one to follow or not. There's a lot that I follow that I probably should have ignored and, and, and a lot of it that did really help me along the way. It's hard to know which one is the right one or not to follow with everything else in life. And so that's why it also should come back to and recognizing you, you, you have to make the choices that you make and, and live by them. When it came to the research question and, and how I kind of go about doing the research, it also goes back to a why. I mean, it's not a cop-up. That's really what it is. People have always kind of commented to me, and it's true. I, I'd say one of my biggest strengths as a researcher is that I'm passionate about what I study. And if you don't have that, if you're not interested in what you study, if it's not personally relevant, if you don't see the application for other people, it's going to be so hard to give your all. And I've heard that from people over and again, and, and I've been studying... You know, people kind of warn me, oh, that first topic you, you get into, you're not going to stick with that forever. You're going to change your mind. And that hasn't been the case for me, really. I mean, my, my master's, it was, you know, there's a huge body of knowledge you're trying to get into and you don't know any of it. And so you have to start somewhere. It's not going to be the perfect one. You just kind of got to start and keep moving, but it, it needs to matter to you. You've got to be interested in it. If you're not interested in it, then again, when things get tough and they will, much easier to just give up then. So it's got to, it's got to be personally relevant. Something you think really matters. And now, you know, as I've grown, I've developed other tactics to kind of identify those questions. But when you're starting out, you don't know the literature, you don't know the gaps, you don't know what you can contribute. You don't know how to contribute to it, right? The methods and the research questions of how you go about solving these things. And so your job really is to learn and to soak up as much as you can 
And in that case, it's learning by doing and, and trying something. So when you try that something though, make it as personally relevant is probably the best advice you can take that, that will keep sustaining you. Yeah. I think that's a really important perspective to have. And I like something that you said, just start and keep moving because something that we deal with all the time is where do we even start? <laughs> as you said, that the body of literature is so big and you're coming in and you're just like in front of this ocean of literature and you don't even know, you know, which grain of sand to start with. <laughs> and so it's so important that you focus that question, that you narrow that question to a place where you can start, where you can start. And one of the most important things I think that I, that one professor said to me, I remember we were sitting in, you know, the seminar room, there were like six people around the table. And I remember exactly who it was. And this professor, she said, your job here is to learn. That's your job. Your job is to learn. And for the purpose of, you know, your thesis or your comprehensive examinations in the PhD, your purpose, your, your number one job is to read. And you're never going to have this opportunity to have to read like this again. There's always going to be other things that you have to do. But now is the time to read and to learn and to absorb. And that really sort of solidified for me the importance of getting started and just moving through. And when you were interested in something to really identify what that was and why and figure out, okay, where does this literature or where does this area actually have a place in my question? Mm -hmm. And so I really like that piece of that piece of advice, start and keep moving. And this is something also that came up in, her, in another podcast episode with Peace, who was doing her master's degree. And we talked through narrowing her question and so, so we'll post a link to that in the show notes. Now, the other part of going through grad school, a really important part that I think people don't talk enough about is choosing your committee. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, I know what my opinions are, and I'm sure our listeners know what my opinions are, <laughs> but what is your opinion about the importance of how you're selecting the members of your committee and who they are? in your process of going through grad school? Yeah, it will definitely depend on the program you're in because they're all also so different. It's That's why you know you try to make these decisions, but you don't know like the situation that you're getting advice from somebody could have been vastly different than what you, what you received. So, you know, for us, at least in my program, it was less about, I think, choosing the committee, but also choosing this, the supervisor who's the head of the committee in almost all cases to help guide you. So in any advice around that, it's also a credibly difficult decision because you chances are you won't really know the person very well. You won't know your working relationship very well. So the advice you would give is less around what you do when you select the person and hopefully they select you too, but also what you can do once you get started with them. A lot of advice I wish I had known about before I, I went with. Now, I think I'm very lucky that I had a, an, an amazing MSc mentor and a PhD mentor who helped guide me in a lot of senses, but the relationships weren't always beautiful. And, and we know that. And, you know, we are today in a great relationship, but it was, you know, there were times where it was really rocky. So it's, it's a strange relationship. That PhD student supervisor, you've got a huge power imbalance and it, it can be a very difficult relationship. The advice that I would take, and actually is exactly what we're talking about in my my class this, this, this week, actually, in organizational behavior is around managing the relationship with your manager. And I tell them, quite frankly, if I'd gone back, I think I would have, I would have, been more proactive in managing that relationships, not making assumptions. So I would send emails and maybe I wouldn't hear back or I'd send long emails. And and yeah, there, there was conflict just in the way in which we were exchanging things, but we never talked about it. So it never really became obvious to us. And so the, the suggestion is, is to proactively ask questions, have an understanding. How do you want me to communicate information? How often should I do that? How do you respond? Right. And so as an example, you know, years later, we kind of realized as we as we went through some conflict and, and had good discussions around them. Uh, okay, when I'm sending these emails, I try to give tons of information because I want kind of wanted my supervisors to know everything was going on. But I had I I really lacked an understanding of just how much else, you know, she had on her plate beyond me, which is understandable. We're we're all working, you know, working through the world with our own eyes. But you know, this is tons of information that actually caused more stress for her not even to respond at all, which was then unsettling for me. And so these are issues that could have been proactively addressed. This idea of managing your boss, like any relationship, a spouse, family, friends, you need to be proactive and manage that relationship or it's not going to go very well. And so the, the advice for me is less around who you pick. And I think, I think in that sense, it's probably the advice you've heard throughout is consistent. It should be in an area that, you know, they can give you guidance with it, with the research. You know, you, you would 
probably want to ask him before you get started about how much mentoring you're going to receive. Are they very hands-on, hands-off? But more than that, it's, it's managing your relationship once you start having these conversations so that everything is really crystal clear when conflict comes up, trying to understand those sources. Otherwise, things fester. They build up and it leads to a lot of the challenges that you hear about in that relationship. Yeah. So something really important that I think you touched on. And so it's no surprise to me that you did the research that you do, which we're going to get to in a second. But talking about how that relationship operationally works. And that's important because this is something that, and we I coach on this all the time. We just had a conversation the other day on this in the Success Society, which was that one of our members was wondering how to communicate through email in order to get a response. And they had drafted this whole email. And I said, just ask one question, one question, because you're right. There's so much more going on on the receiving end of a professor than any than anybody can realize when there are hundreds of students, or when it's exam time, or when it's you know when there's a heavy time in terms of research and collaborations. I mean, and that's true of any job that no one really knows exactly everything that anybody is dealing with, personally and professionally. And so, quite often, it's not the person; it's anything else going on and figuring out how to manage a relationship so that it is productive and effective and efficient for both parties. And that is something that I think that students and young professionals and even senior professionals with whom I work, they don't identify that and they don't deal with those problems head on until we end up talking about, okay, but why don't you ask them this question? How would you like an email to be received? And how would you, you know, how are you digesting this information? And what's the turnaround time that I can expect? You know, and this, this is, is you know, such a, an important conversation for anything. You know, at the law firm, we are constantly talking to other lawyers. And I was talking to one of them that we're on a file with. And I said to them, okay, email this other lawyer, ask them one question, or you're not going to get a response. One question, make it short. And the other lawyer wrote them a question, this, wrote them an email. It was like a few paragraphs long. And what happened? No response. No response. So I followed up a few days later with one question and I got a response instantly. Right. It's all about managing the operations of that relationship. How will this move forward the mo- in the most effective way so that all the parties can be happy and just move on? And I think those conversations are so important. So with that being said, as we transition the conversation into what makes people happy at work, I have a sense that there's going to be a lot of overlap in what makes people happy in relationships. <laughs> so as we transition to, to your, your research, first, maybe share with us your findings around the workplace, and then we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and that's one of the most interesting things that I gravitate to when I started in, in PhD and learning about what leads people to be happy at work and something we talk about in my class because one of my goals is for my students to have jobs that they are happy in and it's going to change. And, and there's, you know, a really interesting theory that I love talking about with people. It's called job characteristics theory and it kind of points to five areas in which we derive some satisfaction from the work that we do. So not let's say how much you get paid or the benefits you get or who you're working with. And those things matter quite a bit, but actually the work itself. That comes down to, to, to these five factors. So one is the significance of your work in the sense of, you know, is it personally meaningful? Are you actually having an impact on people? Another one is the variety of work. So you get to work on a few different kinds of things or are you only really working on, you know, one or two tasks and you get to do lots of different kinds of work. The autonomy that you get into what you do, how you do it, when you do it, Identity is, a, is another one, which is, do you actually get to see the, the full product kind of completed from, from start to finish? Are you touching every element of it or are you only a small piece in the chain? And the last one is, is feedback. Are you getting some idea of how well you're progressing in, in your work from, from the work itself? And, and so whenever I've spoken to people, kind of what makes them happy in the work or what they like about their jobs and dislike, it usually falls in one of those elements. Now, the chances are you're not going to find a job that has all of those in them. So our goal, our job then right now is to try to understand what do I want in a job? What really does make me happy? Again, the colleagues, the coworkers you work with, the pay, though all those things factor in as well. The work itself is what we spend most of our time doing. We know the work itself, those five factors predict employees' satisfaction at work much more than anything else, more than your supervisors, 
more than your teammates, more than the benefits, more than the money you make. The money actually is the, is the least pr- strongest predictor of satisfaction at work because you spend your whole day doing things. And so you better enjoy the kinds of things you're doing. For me, at least, you know, the job I have now, it, it hits the stuff that I really care about, the autonomy, the significance, the variety. Those are the aspects of the work that I do that I love. And it hits the things that I also know that I need in my job. And so for anybody, it's trying to get that sense of what what do you really want? And if it's not that important to you, then okay, find the other one that really is. That's great. And I can I I can relate to everything you've just said. <laughs> because I'm thinking back to jobs that I had, whether it was at law firms or research positions, where, you know, in a more junior role, and even in some senior roles, depending on what the job is and what field, you're only touching a very small piece of the work. And so you never really see it through in some positions. And that's sometimes the nature of the work or the nature of the position or the level that you're at in the the work structure. So I think that that's a really interesting point. And what have you found in terms of the, and I'm always, I'm I'm interested in relationships and in how the relationships actually work in the workplace, because you know, the one of the reasons that I'm really interested in this is because we have so many questions that come up with with our community around how do I deal with this? How do I deal with that? Whether it's grad school or, you know, in our young professionals or our even senior senior professionals, more seasoned professionals who are transitioning fields or transitioning jobs. And the question of, well, how do I deal with X, Y, or Z often comes up and it it is regularly has to do with relationships, the work as well. But I'm, you know, I'm sure you've heard of the, you know, of the, of this, I don't know if it's a saying or whatever it is, but that, you know, people stay in their jobs for the people. Mm -hmm. And so what have you found in the, in terms of relationship building in the workplace and satisfaction? Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, people, like I said, the relationship you have with your manager, good or bad with your colleagues, good or bad. You know, that's a huge impact on how happy we are at our work. You know, it, it's we know conflict is something that happens very frequently in organizations. So it also has to do with how you think about conflict. If that's if that's one route in which this is going, kind of like we talked before, the, probably the best thing for people to do in those situations is is trying to put ourselves in other people's shoes, trying to prevent the assumptions similar to what we were talking about before, and maybe building on some of those challenges I had before. You know, we usually make assumptions about other people's behaviors, and they're usually negative. Whereas if we do similar sorts of things, we kind of, you know, kind of, kind of find a reason for it, right? These are attribution biases, but that's what often conflict gets pretty nasty is because we're usually assuming the worst of why somebody's doing that, right? They didn't respond to my email because they don't care about me as opposed to who knows what's going on in their, in their lives. When you are thinking about a workplace, it's really difficult to know about the people that will be there. And so you're, you're kind of taking a risk in that sense, getting married after right, a first date. It could go in a lot of different ways. So, so for you, it's, it is, you know, trying to think about the culture in which you're applying to. Is that going to attract people who are going to be more like you? Is it a really competitive place, which is going to excite you because it's going to push you to keep put, to keep going past? Is it more of a kind of a family environment, which maybe that interests you because, you know, you, you aren't looking at some career, you don't have huge aspirations, but you want to be in a place that cares about you and actually genuinely cares about you. So that's usually the easiest way to get a sense of the people you're going to be working with because the people are a reflection of the culture of the organization. And fortunately, there are great websites, comparably Glassdoor, that give you a little insight into the culture that's a bit more objective than, let's say, asking questions in an interview. For sure. For sure. Okay. So we're talking about conflict in teams. And what is some advice that you have around dealing with conflict in teams? And I know that a lot of this is situation-based, but the first step is even identifying that there is a conflict that can be managed. And so what is your advice around being able to identify conflict in order to then be able and manage it productively? Yeah. And, and, you know, we do teach on conflict, research on conflict, offer training on conflict management. So it's definitely part of my life. I mean, speaking of personal interests, so when I was in grade three, I was dubbed Mr. Conflict Resolution by, by my teacher. <laughs> so it, it's definitely something I've always been really interested in. And, you know, I, my approach to conflict is going to be different than other people's approaches. And so one of the best things you can do is try to get an understanding of how people deal with conflict, have an understanding of how you deal with conflict and learn when you should be using different kinds of managements of conflict. Probably the first thing I should say, actually, is I, conflict, in my experiences, and the research would suggest, can be both good and bad. And the assumption that it's bad is definitely wrong. And likewise, it's not always good. It depends on a lot of things like how you express 
this disagreement with people. You could do it a really nice way or a not so nice way, right? The tone of an email will make a big difference. That's why I tell my students never send an email when you're angry because you're definitely going to unintentionally, you won't realize that there's a lot of more negative, you know, intonations in that exchange. But a lack of conflict also would be very negative. There's a very big push to psychological safety in organizations right now, which we do a lot of research on. And Amy Edmondson, who pioneered the research on that, would tell you, she'd be the first to say, you know, a, a, a lack of conflict is is not a good thing. It probably suggests actually some underlying dysfunctions in a relationship. If you're not having conflict, probably because you're not speaking your truth, right? You're not actually speaking when things bother you. And and that's usually the best approach, right? Is, is that you do need to be a little bit more proactive about the conflict, thinking about what's it about, right? Are we having conflict about what we're supposed to be doing around, let's say, at work, the tasks that we're doing or... In a home life, you know, our weekend plans, or is it about how we treat each other? And it's those how we treat each other that often gets us into a little bit more trouble. Like I said, one thing that's really helpful is having a sense of your management of conflict, how we typically approach conflict. And I've learned and myself, as an example, I'm very proactive and I usually deal with things, but I'm also learning that there's times then I need to relent a little bit more. I can't always have it. And it's not usually that I'm trying to have it my way. I'm very much what we call, you know, somebody who integrates. I want everybody's ideas to come in and, and let's have the best kind of survive and let, you know, it's not my idea, yours, let's, let's work together. That's just how I approach conflict. But, you know, I'm learning more and more that sometimes the best approach is to avoid it, which I'm not naturally an avoider. Sometimes the best one is to just say yes and accommodate, which is not my natural tendency. And so we have to think about a little bit differently of how we want to respond to people's conflict, recognizing first off, what is your default strategy? I think that that's so meaningful. And I think also that in identifying your default strategy that there's probably for people who are trying to identify conflict or feel as though there's a conflict or operate in one way and they're, you know, they, they are stubborn in their ways. There's a little bit of ego attached to that. And so what have you, have you researched at all the role of ego in conflict? I'm not sure as much about ego per se. It definitely is an involvement in, in, in conflict, right? I mean, yeah. you, especially when it's around, you know, your ideas, you don't want to be the one to, to relent. Why should I? I mean, power absolutely has a huge aspect here because if you don't have any power, it doesn't matter how much you disagree. It's very easy for people to dismiss you. But that also tells us then the people who hold the power, there's a lot that you need to, you know, with great power, great responsibility, Spider-Man, right? A great quote, but it's true in this case of, of you need to be more mindful of how you're kind of making people in, in that case, if it's it's a leader to to somebody on their team, kind of making them do it your way, because that's where abuse of power comes and people stop listening and they're ignoring what you're what you're doing anyways. And so it, it, that's when you have to be a little mindful of when you're in a conflict is kind of that power balance, because that's that could tip the scales. Yeah. And so on that note, what is your view or what does your research tell you about authority versus leadership? You know, there, there is that, you know, there's some great pictures, right? That kind of one I, I've used in my class before where you got kind of leader driving and then you got a manager kind of in the, in the back kind of pushing, right? And, and being quite different. I, you know, I think that's a really good way of thinking about them being different. Leadership is kind of doing in that first sense. So I'll give you a great example of where I think a lot of people go wrong when it comes to leadership and, and management. The idea that really leaders as a leader, your job is to listen and then to speak. Oftentimes what a leader would try to do is kind of say, okay, this is what I think and it could be a leader or manager or using their authority. This is what I think we should do. What do you think? Right. And and inherently, you've created a situation where people aren't really able to carve their own ideas anymore. You've already kind of, in a lot of sense, biased their opinions because they are going to have to follow you to some extent. And so this idea of leaders to speak last, act first, right? Lead by example. But a lot of that case is, is to, to try to withhold your judgment, to listen a lot better. And that's something I know I need to work on and I try to work on as a leader is to, to listen. And listen, then you can offer your ideas. But often what, what a leader will do and is, is to kind of throw their own ideas out there. And it's constraining anybody else from being able to actually make a difference at work. Mm-hmm. And I think that this, this concept and practice, quite honestly, of leadership, because it's not just one day you flip the switch and you're a leader. Like it takes practice. It takes a lot of hard work, reflexivity, effort, and catching yourself, checking yourself to make sure how, how am I operating here? How am I, how am I leading this team versus am I managing or am I using an authority, you know, a a more authoritative way of sort of moving forward? And 
I don't know. I don't know if you know this, but in many professional school applications, and specifically, we saw very recently in the medical school cycle, there was a there was at certain schools the question of what does leadership mean to you. And so I think that this is a really important conversation that we're having because so many people have such different experiences of leadership and how that leadership is framed. And so for anybody out there who's listening, who's who's thinking about, you know, answering this question this year or in a subsequent year, or maybe in a job interview, think about what leadership means to you. Do some research, maybe read some of Kyle's, uh, <laughs> Kyle's work and see really what you think of how, how relationships really help people to grow or hold teams back. I think that that's really, really important. So to piggyback on that Please. idea, to, to, to kind of follow that question, I would try to reflect on the best leaders you've had and what, what, what do they do? What characteristics do they have? What behaviors do they do that they stand out for some reason in your mind as great leaders? And, and those are the kinds of characteristics that you're probably going to think about as, as being really important as a leader. I mean, we, we often think another important distinction, I think, between the two of the manager and a leader is, you know, a, a leader tries to get the better and tries to get the best out of the people that they're leading. Mm. They they lead this idea. There's a theory of called servant leadership, which is your your job pretty much is to is to serve. You're there for the person that you're leading to get them to coach better. As an example of where this would look very different is you know you get a certain work product, and right? a manager might say, okay, like I want it this way. This is this is this is what I need. And so you're almost using the people that work for you or that report to you to get your job done. Whereas a leader would kind of say to themselves, no, I want you to get better. My focus is really on how what I can do for you to improve over this year. And so it's not, I want it done this way, but actually I need to teach you. And teaching is a critical part of leadership yeah. of how you can then grow and improve yourself in the future. We often think, and, and it's, it's it's no fault of anybody who's in this situation, if you've done this yourself before, because people don't get a lot of leadership training. You're, you just, right. You've done really well in your job. And so you got promoted. And now this is what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to lead people, even though you've never learned how to do that. It, it, you know, it's nothing you've ever done before. You probably didn't have any training so one of the big kind of mental ways of thinking about that is is reframing your job as, okay, I'm supposed to get all these things done and these are the people who are going to get it done for me. This is how they're going to get it done. So how do I help my people grow, improve, get better, feel good about themselves? Your job is to, is to keep them motivated, keep them happy, to keep them engaged in their work, not tell them how to get the work done. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's so important from a growth perspective. And so what I'm hearing of a lot of, and, and this is where we spend a lot of our time in conversation, in research and reading, is how do we help people grow? This is from a growth mindset, from an abundance mindset, and also understanding that there is an unlimited amount of opportunity for anybody. And all we have to do is open our minds to it, open up our, our perspectives in order to be able to see it and then receive it. And I think that that it's so important when we're growing teams. Yeah. So important. Yeah. I mean, I think I can, I think I would give an answer even to the question you had posed there, which is how do you go about doing this? It's learning. Mm. You know, when you graduate, this is probably one of the best piece of advice I can offer is is to continuously learn. So growth mindsets, and then we talk about a lot in in my class, I say it might be the most important thing for them to have successful careers. and And I stand by that. And it touches on on learning. I learn is a core por- part of having a growth mindset. And when you graduate, you're not going to be, you, you know, your learning isn't done. When you graduate from undergrad, your learning isn't done. When you graduate from a master's, PhD, your learning isn't done. If you look at your job as, okay, I've already learned this and now I'm, I'm done, you, you're never going to, you're not going to grow. You can't get better. And so it's really embracing learning, you know, yourself. How can I get better as a, as a person, as a leader, which is adopting a growth mindset would, would make a huge difference. And you're not supposed to be the best leader you've ever had. But your first year of being a leader, you, you're probably going to be pretty bad. And that's okay. And actually, if you're not, you're probably not pushing yourself enough to actually get better. And so it's really trying to embrace as much as, and, and I do this with myself as well. What can I, how can I learn to get better so that, you know, next year I'm an even better leader or with that next person, I'm an even better leader. Mm-hmm. And as a process and realizing that in, it never ends. Just like our journey, we're always advancing. We are always learning. And that's allowing us to move through our advancement in a really meaningful way. Yeah. Exactly. And so what are, what maybe what's some of your advice for seeking out a workplace or c- circumstance that is a healthy choice? 
that is a good choice for you. And that may be different for different people. So what are the questions that have arisen from your work that that is actionable that we can actually apply to our decision-making on the ground? So what I'm really trying to get at is what are some, what's, what are some strategies or what are some questions that applicants, right. whether it's to schools or to various jobs, what are some questions that they can ask themselves in order to make sure that they're making the healthiest choice for themselves, you know, embarking on this new program or workplace? Yeah. So there's questions you can ask yourselves and, and questions you'd want to ask the potential workplace, let's say, mm-hmm. if we're going to go with that route that you you would want to know about. You know, I think for your for yourself, it, it, I think it still comes back to what we talked about at the very beginning, which is that why, right? Well, what is your why would also dictate kind of what is a good environment for you. So it does involve personal reflection around even those five components of job characteristics theory or really just recognizing what is it that you really like in a job or in a workplace that would fit with you. You know, we teach culture in my class I emphasize to them a strong belief of mine, which is there's no such thing as a good or bad culture. Like you mentioned, it depends on you. What you like is going to be different than what your friends like. What I would, what I tell them is there's a difference between, let's say, a strong and a weak culture, one in which it's really clear what you're supposed to do and how things operate in this organization, or a weak one is in which people say, oh, these are the values we say, but we don't really live by them. And you, you would want to be in a place that you really have a clear idea of, let's say, the values. And so that's one place to actually get a sense of it. Right, so what are the values of this organization, of the school? What are they really trying to accomplish at the end of the day? Now, you're, what you're learning then in doing that and going through that process, which you can look a lot of times on the websites, most companies will have their values kind of written there. You get a sense of what they say they stand for. But then there's the questions you want to ask people who have been, let's say, to that school or work there saying, okay, are these really the values or are these things that you just say? Can you give me some examples in which you've seen these values? Mm-hmm. To like some great questions I've heard before are, you know, can you tell me about a time when things really didn't go well here? And how did that handle? Can you tell me at a time when somebody was able to make a really big change in the organization, even though they were, didn't have a lot of power, right? What you want to kind of see, and it's the, it's asking the questions that see whether or not the values they say they stand for are really those lived values and whether those values then personally connect to you. Because we know that people are generally much more successful and more likely to stay in companies when they have a fit between their personal values and the company's values. Your job then is to see, are these really the values that you stand for? I think that that advice is so spot on. I think it's so important because what you've also done there is you phrased questions and you framed questions in such a way that applicants to jobs and programs, you know, in potentially if there's, you know, an opportunity for interview or something where you can ask questions is you've actually framed those questions in a really non-combative way in a way that is that is non-confrontational and in a way that is information seeking and so for anybody listening rewind mm-hmm. if you're ever looking for questions to ask in an interview and you're wondering if missions and values and goals of a company for example align with the work that the company is actually doing These are amazing questions to ask because if you want to find a company that, for example, aligns with your values and you want to know that they put their money where their mouths are, then those are great questions. So thank you for that. I think that those are so valuable. Yeah. I'm glad to hear. Yeah. Like, again, you know, if you're asking, you can ask pretty directly, right? Like, do you live by these values, but you're not going to get necessarily an honest answer. And it's a very hard question for actually an interviewee even answer. You can be a little bit more specific in which the the advice then is to look at values and find ways in which you can ask questions that would give you an answer to whether they're lived. Yeah. I think that's great advice. I think that's great advice. And so as our final wrap up question, we always end on the, on this, on this question. And that quest, so you may already know this, but the question is, what is a piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Okay, let me give two pieces of advice because, sure. of course, you know, as a researcher and, and teacher, I, I never <laughs> have enough to say. Yeah. <laughs> One is around the journey, and that is recognizing there is not necessarily going to be a direct path to not feel like you need to have that answer at any point in your life. And I live that as well. I love my job. This is what I was shooting for. This is why I spent a lot of very grueling years going through my, my master's and PhD to get here. That doesn't mean it's a final. And, and, I, and to think of infinality is, is just, it's not going to get you. It's not going to help you advance, as you put as well. I need to really try to embrace as much learning as possible. Seek out opportunities 
you know, thinking, oh, I should get paid for if I'm doing this work. Well, sometimes actually free jobs or free work that you're offering opens up other doors for you as well. And so to try to seek opportunities that you can really push yourself within reason, Mm -hmm. right? Set goals that are challenging, but realistic to keep along the path of learning because learning is the way for your own future, right? Anything you do today to help you learn is going to benefit your future self. And so you have to have a little bit of the mindset. The other one I would offer is, is around how we think about stress and difficulties. Graduate schooling is very stressful. I had a lot of anxiety. I went through a, a panic attack in the middle of my first year that scared, scared me like crazy. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it's something that, as I learned, most people experience. Yeah. But if I look back, it wasn't necessarily just the workload. It was how I looked at the workload. And this is what we call a stress mindset. So I know you talk about mindsets a lot, which I think is awesome. And again, growth mindset, that's exactly what I tell my students would be the most important thing that they can be successful. One of my favorite research that's been published more recently is around this idea of stress mindsets. And that is to try to look at challenges of adversity that you experience functionally as saying, okay, this is, this is how I'm going to get better. And I'm capable of overcoming this and, and not putting all that stress and pressure on yourself to the extent possible. This is where growth mindset would also fit in saying, okay, if I didn't do well, It's not because I suck. It's because maybe I'm not as good as I will be in the future. And simple rewiring of how we look at those problems and how we look at mistakes makes such a huge difference to us physiologically. That would be the the other really big piece is to try to adopt a a perspective around stress as also being helpful for you as maybe showing you that, okay, maybe something is actually wrong. So it's not even just I'm going to grow, but maybe actually this, it's not that this isn't for me, but if I'm feeling this way, it's okay to pivot and nothing's ever closed. And so to to kind of be open-minded with that as well. Those are amazing pieces of advice. Thank you for both of them, all of them, because I think that there were way more in there. And I'm so happy that you you raised all of that and offered that to us. So thank you so much. And if if anybody wants to find you after this episode, after they hear this, where can they find you? LinkedIn, KyleRickman.com. Those are you know good ways to find me, but I'm always pretty responsive and I love connecting with people. So thank you for letting me live my why on this podcast. Oh, anytime, anytime. Thank you so much for your time as well. And thank you so much for joining us on today's podcast and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at applyyourselfglobal and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave this episode a review, and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.